Good morning. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for asking me to speak here. Uh, it's a great privilege uh, to talk to you about uh, our work on trying to understand natural immunity to HIV so that uh, we may uh, help to inform the development of an HIV vaccine. <coughs> it's going to be a little bit different uh, kind of uh, talk than you've been hearing uh, earlier today. Uh, it's really a, a very scientific talk. But uh, HIV is a huge problem globally, uh, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa. There are currently about 33 million people living with uh, HIV, uh, the majority of those in Sub-Saharan Africa, where it uh, not only uh, has a huge impact on the health of individuals who are infected, but also uh, affects society, where you have the youngest people in society, the most productive people, uh, dying of, uh, of this uh, sexually transmitted disease. Um, and in spite of the fact that we have uh, now very effective uh, treatments for HIV, which can prolong life, the pace of new infections uh, being acquired uh, greatly outstrips the rate at which we're putting uh, people on treatment. Only about a quarter of the people that need treatment uh, are receiving it. Uh, and then, uh, I don't think that we're ever going to solve this problem with uh, drugs alone. Uh, and we desperately need uh, new prevention strategies and ideally uh, a vaccine for this disease. So this work uh, is carried out, uh, the story starts in a, a place in Nairobi called Majenga, which is a slum area in the middle of a market where uh, we set up a clinic uh, for female sex workers in uh, 1985. The reason we set up the clinic was to study uh, Im immunity to sexually transmitted infections, particularly gonorrhea. But uh, we thought as an interesting side study, and this was at a time when uh, it wasn't recognized that HIV was a huge problem in Africa, we thought an interesting side study would be to see that, uh, to determine if there was any HIV in this community. And we enrolled a group of uh, 600 sex workers in our uh, first uh, uh, go at it. Uh, and when we tested them for HIV, we found that two-thirds were infected with the virus. This is at a time when it was thought that women didn't, uh, weren't very susceptible to HIV. And it was completely uh, a shock that there was this level of HIV uh, uh, infection in this group. Uh, so we were interested in trying to figure out uh, why, uh, in, in the, the context of the sort of scientific understanding that, which was wrong, that uh, HIV was a disease of men, how did these, uh, all these women become infected with HIV? And so we did an epidemiologic study, and the main, uh, one of the main correlates of being HIV positive was if a, the longer a woman was involved in prostitution, the less likely she was to be HIV positive. So that's backwards to what you would normally see. Uh, and the only way that could happen if, uh, is if in this population some individuals are relatively resistant to infection. Uh, and this was at a time when HIV was spreading very rapidly throughout, uh, throughout uh, the Kenyan population, ultimately resulting in about 15% of the entire uh, healthy young adult population being infected with HIV. Uh, and sex workers uh, were at the center of this uh, outbreak and also uh, uh, very susceptible to infection, but also um, important in transmitting the infection onto, onto others, their, their partners. Uh, we put in place interventions to, uh, to try to reduce HIV, uh, notably using, uh, we had a very uh, rapid increase in the rate of uh, use of condoms in this population, but that didn't stop uh, HIV. Uh, and uh, our initial hypothesis that some people were relatively resistant to HIV is uh, really you can't test that in people, and there aren't any appropriate animal models. So what we did is to follow individuals over time. And what we saw is over the, this is a, 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 a what we call a Kaplan-Meier plot, showing the fraction of individuals who remain HIV uninfected. So what we saw over the first three years of study uh, of these HIV negative individuals that about 50% of individuals became infected over two years and 60% uh, over about three years. 
but gradually the rate of new infections flattened out and people were less and less and less likely to become HIV infected. Uh, and this essentially proved that some individuals were resistant to HIV. Uh, we've, uh, we're not the only ones who are finding this. There are populations around the world who appear to be relatively resistant to HIV infection. And that can be couples in which one individual is positive and the other isn't. It's gay men, it's female sex workers, it's uh, uh, children born to HIV infected mothers. Uh, this is an area of great interest uh, because we think, and others is, think as well, that this is a model of natural immunity. And if we can understand what uh, constitutes natural immunity, really asking two questions, uh, what is protecting these women and why them? Why are they special? We may be able to, uh, to develop an HIV vaccine. And we've done a lot of work on this. Uh, we've been re really working on it since uh, 1985 or so. Uh, and we know that uh, it's not a result of differing sexual practices or that they have HIV infection that we can't detect by normal tests. Uh, we know that certain genetic uh, markers that are important in North American uh, or Caucasian populations are, are not involved. And everything we uh, have learned points to two things. One is that there seems to be immunity involved, that they have uh, certain types of uh, immune responses to HIV that uh, people who haven't been exposed to the virus wouldn't have, and also that there are familial associations. This phenomena tends to cluster in families, so we think there's probably some genetic basis for it. Uh, so we've had money over the last uh, five years from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for something called uh, Grand Challenges in Global Health. And our project was entitled Immunity, Not Luck, uh, trying to comprehensive studies of the mechanisms of uh, HIV resistant in these highly exposed, uninfected women. But one of the things, you may have a trouble appreciating this, but one of the things we're able to do is look at the gene expression of about 56,000 genes uh, using what's called a, uh, a microarray. And each of these little rectangles on this uh, uh, slide uh, represents the expression of one gene. And the green indicates that the gene is downregulated compared to controls, and the red indicates it's upregulated compared to controls. But what we found was in our resistant women, which are shown here, they have a very, very similar pattern of gene expression to each other that is quite different from what we see in individuals who are susceptible to HIV, who are like you and I. So we have, we think, uh, a gene expression phenotype that is a signature for these women, something special about them. And it's kind of reassuring that they all seem to be fairly similar. So it may be that we can figure out what the one thing that is uh, involved in protecting these women is. Uh, the one thing seems to be um, something we're calling immune quiescence. Uh, these individuals have uh, lower overall gene expression in uh, cells of the immune system. Uh, they also have uh, lower gene expression of genes that are important in uh, HIV replicating. HIV has to hijack the body cellular machinery in order to replicate. And also lower expression of genes that are involved in, uh, in cellular immunity. However, uh, they have uh, a normal ability to respond to, uh, to other types of antigens, uh, 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 what we call recall antigens. So if you expose their white blood cells to influenza or uh, other uh, types of infectious agents, they respond like you and I would, uh, but they just have a lower overall baseline. And that's important in that HIV requires activated cells in order to replicate. It doesn't replicate in cells that are, um, that are quiescent. And so we've developed what we call a two-phase model of HIV resistance. So in a susceptible individual, you have a large number of activated cells that are targets for HIV. The virus is able to, uh, to, to infect these cells and replicate. Uh, and the body, through its uh, immune system, uh, can't really deal with the infection because it just happens too fast. In these HIV-resistant women, whatever is controlling this, they have fewer activated cells. Uh, the fewer cells that the virus can infect, and they, their immune system is able to deal with the infection. Uh, we're very actively trying to understand what is behind this phenomena of IQ, or 
immune quiescence. And we think if we can understand that, we may be able to make an HIV vaccine or develop topical uh, therapies uh, that may prevent infection. Uh, and we identified a number of factors in the female genital tract, and this is meant to be the, uh, the surface of the vagina, a whole bunch of different uh, things, such as this protein olefin or trapin-2, uh, alpha defensins, uh, slippy, that uh, appear to be involved in, in mediating this phenomena. We don't yet know which is the one that is most important, but uh, uh, they all point to, uh, the, or they all fit in very nicely with this whole hypothesis of, uh, of immune quiescence. One of the ways in which we're studying this phenomena is through something called proteomics. And uh, we have very, very powerful tools now in, in biology, uh, something called systems biology, where instead of studying one thing, like one protein or one gene, as, which is what we used to do, uh, say, seven or eight years ago, you can study all of the proteins in a, in a particular sample and try to understand the interaction. And that's, that's important because you can't understand something as complicated as the relationship between the human body and HIV by studying one protein at a time. Uh, and so we use a, a, a tool called uh, mass spectrometry to measure all of the different proteins that we find in, uh, in the genital tract of these, uh, of, of these re resistant women. And this is work that was led by Blake Ball and Adam Bergener from uh, our laboratory. And we found that, uh, indeed, there are differences in the expression of proteins in the cervical vaginal fluid of these HIV resistant sex workers compared to controls. And this is a picture of how we, how we measure this. Each little dot on, this, uh, on these uh, uh, gels represent one protein. And we found that a whole bunch of proteins are different. Uh, the, the proteins that are uh, overexpressed in these women uh, are uh, proteins that involve in dampening the immune response, making the immune system quiescent. So fitting in very nicely with our whole, uh, uh, whole hypothesis of, of immune quiescence. And the w ones that are underexpressed are those that are uh, related to HIV replication. Uh, so some of these proteins have been known to be involved in uh, inhibition of uh, HIV previously, uh, but others are totally new. And some of these proteins may be uh, useful as a topical microbicide or uh, used in concert with an HIV vaccine to make people immune to HIV. Uh, and we hope to begin to take some of these, uh, these natural proteins uh, through the, the process of uh, preclinical development and ultimately into, uh, into clinical trials. So this two-phase model of HIV resistance, which I showed to you before and explained, seems to be really critical in uh, this whole phenomena of resistance to HIV, and also points to uh, the, the fact that, uh, I think, strengthens the argument that these individuals are in some way immune to HIV. Uh, as I said, uh, this is not the only group in the world that appears to be uh, have different susceptibility to HIV. You have lots of uh, other, uh, other groups around the world. And about a year and a half ago, we brought uh, uh, the, the community that studies this phenomenon together in Winnipeg. Uh, it was in November uh, last year. It was co-hosted by the University of Manitoba and the International Center for Infectious Disease. We had 100 scientists from five continents gathered to share information. And ultimately, the, the, the result of that meeting was a formation of a consortium that, to, to study this phenomenon. So we can exchange uh, information, exchange uh, specimens, and kind of come to some common understanding of what is underlying this phenomenon. Uh, so this is the largest group that was ever assembled to, uh, to study correlates of HIV protection. And all in all, there are about 20,000 subjects uh, involved um, in this uh, in this consortium, uh, and we have great hope that we'll be able to come to some kind of understanding of what uh, constitutes natural immunity to HIV, what's protecting these individuals, and what's special about them. So I'll stop there uh, with uh, the story not complete. We haven't developed an HIV vaccine, but we believe that this is the path to do that, uh, either a vaccine or some kind of therapeutic that might prevent infection. And uh, maybe in a couple of years, I'll come back and, uh, and finish the story. Thank you.